Good evening and welcome to this online event from the British Library. Uh, tonight we're absolutely delighted to be welcoming Joanna Cannon and Nina Stibby to talk about their books and their writing lives with Kathy Renson Brink. Um, it's uh, in our classic British Library style, you can add your questions into the form below the screen later on, or at any time, in fact, during the conversation, just below your video window, there's a screen where you can uh, fill out your question and send it in, and we'll get through as many as we can. And also, if you want to buy books by our authors today, there is a bookshop tab at the top of your screen. Uh, you can click and that will take you through to the British Library bookshop, and you'll be able to make an order if you want to. Um, so, as I said earlier, Kathy Rensenbrink uh, is, is chairing tonight's conversation with Joanna and Nina. Um, Kathy herself is, a, is an acclaimed memoirist and an author of the Sunday Times bestseller, The Last Act of Love, as well as A Manual for Heartache, Dear Reader, The Comfort and Joy of Books, and Everyone is Still Alive. Kathy is also uh, regularly teaching creative writing to all comers no matter what their experience, education, background or story, from Arvon to Falmouth University and at festivals and even in prisons. And her book about memoir writing is called Write It All Down and is out now, as is her first novel, Everyone is Still Alive. It's going to be a terrific conversation and I'll hand you over to Cathy. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. I feel very glad to be alive. I'm glad that everyone is still alive on this night <laughs> because I feel very pleased to have the privilege of being here this evening with all of you and with Joanna Cannon and Nina Stibby, um, novelists extraordinaire, I would say. They've also done other things as well. So we might even get on to some of that. So um, Joanna Cannon's first book was called The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. She's also written another novel, Three Things About Elsie, and a memoir, Breaking and Mending, about her life as a healthcare professional. Um, Nina Sibby's first book was Love Nina, and then she followed that collection of letters with a trilogy of novels about Lizzie Vogel, in which we saw Lizzie um, go from a small girl and how she grew up. And her latest book now is One Day I Shall Astonish the World. Joe's is a tidy ending. They're both... Uh, extremely different novels, I think, but I think they are, I would say, and maybe the, maybe the novelists in question can disagree with me if they like, I think they're unified by how both of them, they have an extremely strong voice. So from the first sentence, you feel that you are there with the character, the first person narrator. So I wonder, Joe, could I start with you? Would you just tell us a bit about that voice about how Linda um, arrived with you, if that indeed is how it happened. Yeah, I completely agree with you on the voice thing. <clears throat> um, my novels always start with a voice at the risk of sounding vaguely psychotic. Um, I always hear a voice um, and I think you need a strong voice, especially obviously character led books as Nina and I both, both write, you need to have a strong voice. And Linda, who's the main character in A Tidy Ending, actually started life as a short story. I uh, used to go to Stories Aloud at Blackwell's in Oxford and they had an evening where they would invite authors to write a short story and it would be narrated by an actor and you could either pay an entrance fee or you could bring cake. So I really enjoyed that event um, and I heard um, an actor called Melissa Berry read various different authors' stories and she's Welsh and she has this kind of almost vaguely psychotic but just leaving a little lid on it, boiling over just about kind of voice. And I thought, oh, if I ever get asked to write a story, I'm going to ask Melissa to, to narrate it. And they asked me, and I wrote this story about Linda, uh, which is called Captivating. And Linda's a kind of um, middle-aged woman living in a very hoardenly housing estate, married to a guy called Terry, who she doesn't really love if she ever did, works part-time in a charity shop and really doesn't like her life. Um, and they'd moved into a new house and mail starts arriving for the, the woman who used to live in the house who's called Rebecca in a nod to Daphne and my favorite book of all time. And Linda starts comparing herself to Rebecca and who Rebecca might be. And she decides that if um, she can find Rebecca and make friends with her, some of Rebecca's magic will rub off on Linda. So she sets off to try and claim the life she believes she should have had. And in the meantime, a series of young women are going missing on the estate and her husband is keeping very odd hours at work. Uh, but Linda's more interested in finding the new Linda than she is in, in worrying about what her husband's up to. Um, so hopefully Linda does have a strong voice um, and she's definitely got a Welsh voice. And I think she speaks perhaps for a lot of us who are a little bit dissatisfied with our lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she's certainly extremely powerful. And I was very much um, 
I was just involved from the first sentence and knew that I didn't want to stop learning about her and her progress through this journey. Um, I really like the way you described it. I don't know if I'll get it right. I mean, please correct me if I don't. You said, you said she's married to a man called Terry and if she ever loved him, she doesn't anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, if she ever did. Yeah, yeah if she ever did, uh, which is, again, very uh, poignant, isn't it? Um, mm. And full of promise. So, yeah. um, so that's, that's, the, that's the origins of Linda. And what about you, Nina? How did Susan arrive? Um, Susan arrived because I wanted to write a contemporary novel or written from the now. And I wanted her to be older and I wanted her to be dissatisfied, but very clever, but very ordinary. I think that's another thing these two women have in common, my narrator, Susan, and Joe's narrator, Linda. They're really ordinary and they live in ordinary houses um, and have ordinary lives. And they feel um, that life could have been different it could have been better they could they could they've got a lot to offer i think they're both very bright they they're both philosophers aren't they they mm. comment and they observe and linda joe's narrator although she's got a not a particularly satisfying marriage with terry she doesn't really think much of marriage anyway i don't think but she says at one point something like oh in fact i've got it here she says about and she sees a couple in the pub arguing and she says they hadn't no yes yeah, she's a couple arguing she, linda says they hadn't been married long i don't think they're at the stage when you still have things you care about enough to argue about that that, that they were at the early stage of marriage so they still bothered and whereas i think my narrator is a bit more idealistic I think she thinks there's perhaps more to be had out of that relationship. Whereas Linda's looking elsewhere. She's looking in herself, isn't she? Yeah. And, but yeah, the voice came from frustration from my, my narrator. She's frustrated, but she's very clever, I think. <laughs> she's definitely clever. Definitely. Very clever. And yeah. And so it, it went from there really. Can we dig into this marriage thing a bit more? Because I did, well, you know, one of the things I very much enjoyed about most novels is the, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's all right for people who like it, isn't it? But just novels where like the point is that someone gets married to someone else. I just find them so tedious. Yeah. So, <laughs> was, yeah. Was, it, um, was it, did you intentionally, both of you, want to put marriage in the dock or say something about marriage or, and you get it, you, you may not have done, like, but did you, would you, was marriage intentionally a theme? Yes. For me, the book was going to be about marriage until I sent my first draft and my publisher said, I like the marriage, but I'm much more interested in the friendship between these two women that's a dysfunctional friendship. So why don't you push the marriage back a bit and bring this friendship between these two middle-aged women to the fore, which I did. So my marriage is a little bit, bit more foggy than it was in the first draft. And in the first draft, the book was utterly grim. <laughs> I mean, really grim. <coughs> my, my editor must have a really good marriage because she said this, can't, this is unrealistic. And I went, <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, yikes. <laughs> and you let her guide you away from that as the primary yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What about you, Jo? Um, I think it was a little bit of a retaliation from me putting a commentary about, I mean, I'm not married, so I can't really comment on people's marriages, but whenever I do an interview, not your kind of interview, Cathy, because you're brilliant, but when I do kind of magazine and newspaper interviews, the three questions I am guaranteed to be asked, usually in, in quick succession, is, are you married? Do you have children? How old are you? <laughs> and I yeah. find it so dull. Yeah. I find it so dull. And I know some people like to read about people getting married and having relationships. And that's brilliant because I could never write those books. But I just wanted to have a little commentary that life isn't quite as idyllic as the media would have us believe, as advertising would have us believe. Because a lot of this 
the problem with Linda is she she compares herself to everyone and she's comparing herself to unrealistic things that actually don't exist things in magazines and brochures and online and when I worked as a doctor before I was an author I used to a lot of outpatient clinics as a psychiatrist and I see a lot of people with anxiety and depression and as part of the history you would say can you remember how it started and so many of them would say it started with something I saw on Facebook and it would be this comparison thing is comparing your life to somebody's curated version, to the showreel of somebody else's, this perfect marriage and perfect children mm. and a beautiful holiday and a wonderful Christmas tree. And, and it, it's this, this comparison that got Linda into the state that she's in. So I think marriage is a, a part of that because we're bombarded with images of happy marriages, especially at certain times of the year. when we think if we're not living that life, there must be something wrong with it. So yes, I deliberately had a little dig at marriage, even though I'm not really in a position to do it because I'm not married. So. Well, you know, it's well, I am. <laughs> much to do it, isn't it? Um, what about what about you, Nina? Or you might feel you've said enough about marriage. I don't want to needle you too much. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, what can I say? It's um, the marriage is is really not much fun. It, it's not awful, and the the narrator isn't at risk, or there's there's no aggression. But it is quite dull and loveless and ordinary. And she, the narrator, is just looking around at every other part of her life to find fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So she's sort of, she's not in love with her boss, but he listens to her and they do the crossword together. And she sort of starts feeling romantic about him, not because she genuinely feels attracted to him, just that it's much nicer than being at home. <laughs> Susan's husband puts his fingers in her, his ears like this when she talks, sneakily, does that. Susan's husband, I'm saying, you notice. <laughs> because he doesn't want to have to hear her. He just doesn't want to hear her rambling <laughs> on. And she, and she gets home and he's sort of putting a, a, a golf ball into a paper cup and she's bored with that. So it's a two-way thing. <laughs> and... Yeah, so my, my narrator is married and has a child and it's not particularly happy making. I think that's my point. Now, I am married and I do have two kids and they're grown up now, but, you know, I'm, it hasn't been awful, but it's, you know, it's fun to write about it. There's just, so, I think across the board, there's just such a difference, isn't there, between expectation and reality, mm -hmm. I think, and, the, you know, mm -hmm. that whole grass is always greener seems to have this really horrible modern application because as you say joe everybody's envious about what they're seeing on facebook but they're envying stuff that's not real mm. you know i think that i think that's the thing and all the people that have well sometimes the people that have got the thing that seems um enviable they're they're, they're just showing the two minutes of it that they can stand you know? mm. <laughs> yeah kind of, no absolutely you know, it's a, yeah. sort of a stew of unhappiness isn't it yeah with yeah. social media i've got to the stage now where when i see those perfect posts i don't do facebook but i do look at instagram and i do a bit of tweeting when i see the perfect things I, it, it's gone so far for me now that i think i feel oh my god you poor cow you've had to <laughs> You've had to set all that up. Mm. Might you absolutely go and live? I honestly think people <laughs> are beginning to think, crikey, you know, how long did it take you to do that? Mm. Oh, That's yeah, when you get these these flat lay things where there's all these beautiful things in. And I yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah, that and is a lot just of Just even... I mean, I, I I do Instagram and I do try and make it ni look nice. So I'll say, okay, get that napkin out of the way. I want to put our lobster on. <laughs> and so I, so I make everyone make it and people go, hurry up then, hurry up then. So I know just doing one of my crappy posts takes a lot of faff and it's mm. not real. So mm. I'm I, for me, it's like Brechtian. I know what's gone on. I know the hard work and I'm not mm. particularly impressed. Mm. I would rather see a bit of chewing gum on the street that's gone into a pretty shape. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I completely agree. I completely agree. And I think we are getting wise to it. Mm. I hope so. But I think with young people, there's a documentary actually on BBC iPlayer about Instagram and eating disorders, which if yeah. anyone is, is interested in that is very well worth a watch. It's very disturbing. Yeah. Because yes. I think, you know, with younger people, they are, they yes. perhaps haven't got our life experience. Yeah. Um, and they do take it all as reality. Mm. 
Mm. And they are comparing themselves constantly. And I remember Jojo mm. Moyes once was talking about a girl that she was on the tube next to, a young girl, who was taking endless selfies and deleting mm. them, take a selfie, delete, because they weren't good enough. And it's a form mm. of self-harm almost. Yes, to, agreed. To be behaving it's very like worrying. That. It's very sad, very sad. Yeah. Um, so we've got all these themes, whilst not necessarily on the nose in the novels, are there, aren't they? This notion of how difficult it is to compare yourself to other well how bad it is for you to compare yourself to other people but maybe also how natural it's a very natural human thing to do it isn't it Nina would you tell me tell us a bit about the this central friendship because one of the things Susan does is kind of compare herself to her friend Norma isn't yeah. it yes Susan has a very good friend called Norma who she met when they were both um undergraduates and um Norma goes from strength to strength academically and professionally and does very very well she doesn't she does have a, a marriage or two but they're never brilliant but she doesn't want to have children and doesn't she wouldn't dream of having children because she's busy and focused and she she's not terribly um sympathetic to Susan and her problems she's quite hard on Susan I think she thinks she made a mistake having a child as early as she did and she thinks you'll you'll just dwindle it intellectually and you'll you'll never achieve anything and in a way she's proved right because Susan does never achieve what she might um, pretty much and so they have this rather difficult relationship although they're best friends they don't really get on terribly well and they're not actually that nice to each other and that interested me. I mean, as I said earlier, it interested my editor to the point that I made more of this friendship. But it was what's interested me since the book's come out is that some people think Norma is horrible to Susan and other people think Susan's just a, an idiot and that she she's written the script and she she's neurotic about Norma that that you know different people side with these two women it's it's been quite interesting mm. and I sort of sided with Susan and thought Norma was mean but more and more I think actually I think Norma is always honest and straightforward if a little abrupt but she's I think perhaps Susan's misread her sometimes and um yeah and which I think happens with with friendships I think these again it's a bit like a marriage it's that thing where you see someone's got a really good pal and you think, oh God, you know, they're so, they're so great, these great pals. Well, great pals aren't always great. Yeah. They can be real bitches. Yeah. Sorry, but they can. It is the same, isn't it? I think that, so again, as well as, as well as envying people's pretend marriages yeah. uh, you can envy people's friendship groups can't you or yeah. um, mm -hmm. to think like gosh that looks nice I always envy I've never had like a gang you know like all those tv programs assume that you've got some kind of gang around you yeah, um, yeah. the best yeah. days of our lives that kind of that sort of idea and then yeah. you start thinking like was well, there something wrong with me that I'm not hanging around with five really photogenic people I know <laughs> I actually wrote an opinion piece on this topic um and I was really nervous I was I wrote a piece saying I've never had a best friend ever and I was I'm an only child of an only child I was the kind of kid that hung around the edge of the playground and I had to join in and I've never had a best best friend and like you said the media will constantly pump this thing at us that we need to have a best friend and female yeah. friendship is wonderful and yeah. your female friend will stand your corner and so I wrote this piece and my mum goes, do you really have to write that? People will think you're so strange. <laughs> and I said, yes, I really do. And I was so nervous about this piece coming out, especially because it wasn't in a newspaper that I would choose to read myself, shall we say. Um, and I had so much feedback from people saying that they were the same. They didn't have a best friend. Mm. The, the engagement on this piece is unbelievable. That's um, brilliant. And it just shows you, you know, it just takes yes. one person to say, well, actually... I don't have a best friend. That makes yes. me weird. And all yes. these people feel feel solidarity, which is great. Yeah. Well, my thing, my thinking was that even if you do have friends, they don't. 
we we accept that sisters will argue and and married couples will argue and neighbors will argue and colleagues will be competitive but we think that female friends have to be these either these sort of angels and you know saintly patient lovely generous giving loyal or they're in one of your novels joe and they're a psycho <laughs> and they're gonna you know sneak sugar in your tea or yeah. your husband but I think that they're not necessary. I think they're a, they're like just like one's siblings or one's mum or one's neighbour. They're a mix. Yeah. But yeah. this is what people can't accept. I think about female fre female friendships. It's mm. it's odd. It's mm. an odd thing. Yeah. Yeah. Another media controlled. Yes. Myth that we have to deal with. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that we would love to have your questions, so you can ask questions about. Marriage, friendship, writing, whatever you like. I've got this, I've got this, uh, I've got, I'm all poised for them to come through um, on my phone. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, Nina, something else you said in the middle of that really interested me because you said about, um, you said the response, basically you kind of said that the response to the novel had made you rethink the novel and your character's in it and I'm interested in that because I mean I definitely do that I mean I'd always say it's like it's developed to the point where I almost think it's the point for me I write a novel because I want to know what other people think about it or I write a book because I want to know what other people think and then that will enlarge and expand my mind whether I agree or not but I, I'm not sure I'm not sure that I don't know I don't know whether everybody else does that so I was interested when you said it that reader response did cause you to possibly change your mind about what was going on in the Page, yeah. think that Susan might have misread some things. Yes, a bit more about that. Yeah, one uh, critic, well, I don't know what you call them, reviewer, said that it might even have been you, Kathy, <laughs> said that Susan and Norma could even be one person. They might, they could have been the two sides of one person. Now, if you hadn't said that, or whoever it was, I'm, and I, some, if if my neighbour had said it, I might pretend that 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 that's what I was doing. <laughs> Um, because somebody did it, somebody, oh, it was Sorrow and Bliss. I don't know if you read it, Joe. the book by... Uh, Meg Mason. Mason, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she said that the two sisters in that book, the, the, the main uh, character, um, Martha, had this sister, Ingrid, and um, she was going to have it that Ingrid was imaginary, and I think that's interesting that with a sister, you, you could, you, you know, that, that would have worked. Mm. You didn't do it in the end. She decided mm. not to. But equally, I could have done that. And so that you can play around with characters. And, um, but that's not really answering your question, Cathy. The answer to your question is, yes, I have changed my mind on, on um who is the manipulative one out of my two main characters. And I think Susan's probably more guilty than I realised when I was writing her. I've, up until very recently, I have naturally been a, a people pleaser. I've just even a, a sort of changed my opinion to, to agree with people just because I don't want to upset them. But I'm trying to stop that because I realise that's a bad thing. I used to think it was a good thing. <laughs> I re when I first started writing, writing this novel, Susan's so giving and so thoughtful and so overly nurturing that I thought that made her good. I now think it makes her a bit of a twat. Sorry for using the T word, but it does. She's an idiot. <laughs> oh, Sorry, very sweet though as well. No, but she's got to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> has she? She has. <laughs> what about you, Joe? Have you ever? How do you feel about when people <laughs> say things about your novel? Does it ever make you think about that in a different way, or add on, or do you just think like, no, I knew what I was doing, and you're reading it wrong? Well, I don't quite know how to follow that. Um, <laughs> I would say I'm, I always get really interested in which bits people pull out of a book that they enjoyed. That fascinates me. People will pull out sentences and paragraphs and scenes that they found particularly moving. And it's always something different for different people, which, which always fascinates me. Um, probably the, the most intriguing thing that I ever had said to me, uh, there was a, a book club. I can't remember, it was abroad somewhere. It, it was like 
Morocco or Marrakesh or somewhere. And it was expats. So it's British book club. And they all read The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. And the woman who was in charge of the book club wrote to my agent, emailed my agent with this massive, massive long email, like a, like a dissertation about her analysis of the book, which my agent very kindly passed on to me. Um, and at the end, she said, in the final scene of The Trouble with Goats and Sheep, there are 13 people standing on the avenue, which is clearly the 12 disciples in Christ, uh, but which one of them is Judas. And I thought, damn it, why did I not think of that? I didn't even know how many people were standing on the avenue at the end of the... You know, people will see things in a book that you never even crossed your mind. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is interesting because writing a book is like standing on a giant stage and saying, this is how I see the world. Does anybody else feel the same way? Mm. Which is a very vulnerable thing to say. Mm. Um, so I love, like you, Cathy, I love the feedback because my books really is just me ironing out my thoughts mm. and trying to understand myself better. And every book I write, when I look back, I think I know why I wrote that now. I know what was going on in my life that made me think those things and question that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote that book. So it, it's always fascinating for me to listen to how other people see it. Definitely. And is it, I think it is from the way you phrased it, because I, this is how I feel. Like I might not know at the time or at the time mm -hmm. I might think I want to do this because of this. And then much later on, I'll think, oh, that was because of. That. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's, there's something, especially with three things about Elsie, I wrote something really random that didn't really have any particular meaning to me on say page 27. On page 263, it all made sense. There was like this subconscious thing in my mind. I thought, that's why I said that. Mm -hmm. And it all came together. So I, and I've spoken to other authors and Nina's nodding um, who, who have the same experience. There's some kind of subliminal level. Yeah. You are knitting this together in your mind and making sense of it, which fascinates me, especially as somebody who's studied the human mind. Mm. It does fascinate me how we do that, definitely. And do you think that because of that, I'm really interested to know, I'd really love to know about your process, both of you. Um, I used to think that I, you didn't, I don't know, like needed to learn to be a better planner or whatever. I used to get cross with the fact that I couldn't really think in a linear way. But lately, mainly because I think I read something Hilary Mantel said about this, <laughs> which is that she says the main job of it is just to sort of like make yourself available so that all this stuff that you don't understand that we're talking about can happen. <laughs> yeah. To not try to be too kind of like whip cracky about it. That might be me rather than her. I basically mind melded myself with Hilary Mantel there. But how do you, what do you think about that, Joe? Do you try to like leave some freedom in the work or do you um, kind of plan it and? I don't plan it at all. I have no post-it note theme going on. I think if you write something that's like a police procedural or a thriller, you need, you need to have it all planned out. So you write yourself into a corner. But because uh, Nina and I write character-driven things, you have a lot more freedom. <clears throat> and I always know the last line of every book I've written. I always know exactly the last line. And I have the voice of either Grace or Tilly or Linda. And off we go on a journey. And I know it's, it's as if I was saying, well, I, I know I'm going to Glasgow and I'm going to arrive in Glasgow. I don't know what roads I'm taking. I don't know where mm. I'll go and call for petrol. Mm. I'm going to end up in Glasgow. And mm. I don't always. Sometimes I wake up in Torquay. And I think <laughs> I have to rearrange this slightly. I'm going the wrong way. But that, that is my method. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote Goats and Sheep, I didn't know the face of Christ would appear on a drain pipe. I had no idea. And I think if I'd planned it all in post-it notes, I wouldn't have ever gone there because I would have had this kind of corridor of thinking where I, I had to do a certain thing mm. so I love the freedom of, of not knowing where Linda is going to take me I'm surprised that you, this um this latest book a tidy ending wasn't meticulously planned because it does read like a thriller that has been actually meticulously plotted out no no I just I wow. didn't have any I that's didn't. amazing I because just have I a lot of time on my hands <laughs> Yeah, but don't I don't plan. plan either, but I never end up with anything approaching a, that, you know, the story developing in that way and all the pieces and, you know. I think you do. I think you no. do. Gosh. So what do you start with, Nina? Do you, do you start with a voice and then just let it take you? I start with a voice and, <clears throat> and I build around lovely details that I like. So the, the face in the drain pipe, Christ's face in the drain pipe, something like that. I would, I already ha have copious notes with, 
you know, award-winning fruitcake or a cheese plant or a dog with three legs. I love that, yeah. I you know, that's that. how I do it. And I just built everything. <laughs> the story has to build around the things I like. Mm. And I have been slightly negatively reviewed because of that. But then most of my readers seem to not mind. So I'm not going to mind too much. Also, three of my four novels have been very autobiographical. So it's been much easier because I sort of know where I'm, I know I'd start when we were living there and doing that, and then I'll sort of stop it there. But this last book was much harder, but I still didn't plan it. Mm. Um, Tell us a bit more, Nina, about those autobiographical novels and why you, why you decided to, given that you wanted to write autobiographically, I mean, why did you decide to write novels, not a memoir? Um, I thought I wouldn't be able to say all the things I was saying. Simply this, if I thought the people I was writing about would be furious and try and kill me if I wrote the truth. And, but then I just did it and then I said I'd, I'll pretend it's a novel and then very quickly somehow said it wasn't. I mean, it's not 100% autobiography, it's like 90% probably. And I've got rid of a few family members because there were too many to handle. But um, yeah, I thought people would be absolutely furious, especially my parents. Um, but yeah, they weren't. Well, they might they might have been and they just lying. But I, I think they seem all right with it. My dad died anyway, so it doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> sorry, Kathy. Um, uh, sorry, that sounded awful. What I mean is, if, that he was alive for three of them and, and seemed to enjoy everything. Yes. Um, it didn't sound awful. We knew what you meant. We knew exactly what you meant. It was funny, which is what it was. <coughs> you were funny and because life is funny even when it's difficult and people yeah. die. So yeah. it, it, it was... sounded as if I wrote a few novels and it killed him. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a few memoirs disguised as novels and it killed the poor guy. But no, he's fine. And my mum was fine. I mean, the weird thing is, Joe just said it's funny when readers tell her what parts of her novels they really find moving and they love, and mm. it's different every time. The thing I found oddest about people responding to my books, particularly the first three, is the things that my family have minded. So I'll say to my mum, read this quickly, hurry up because I've got to hand it over. Um, is there anything you don't want me to put in there? And some of the things the mother does in the novel are you know, really naughty and bad and not very good parenting but the things she's minded have been really odd like for mm. instance in there's one uh part of a book where <laughs> she sends the mother sends her nine and ten year old to london from the midlands to get her drugs and it's, it's a regular thing and off these girls go and they buy these drugs and then you know with a wad of money buying illegal drugs and and of course my mum would remember that we, we did do that um so I thought she'll probably say you can't have that you going up to this doctor and getting these drugs so you'll have to take that out and I was fully expecting to do that so at the end I said so okay how what do you think she went oh god she went there's one thing though I really don't want in there she went I would never call a child Danny I just couldn't believe it. I said, so, okay, well, you don't like that. Well, anything else? And she went, no, I think everything's perfectly fine. <laughs> and Colm Tabeen has a story about when his mother, he'd written about his mother quite brutally. And he said, is there anything you really can't bear? And she, he, she Colm Tabeen's mum said, yes, I hate it the way you have me collecting the cutlery and just plonking it down on the dinner table and not setting it all out. <laughs> Should it make me look so slovenly? And he couldn't believe it. He thought, well, hang on. But what about all these cruel things that you do? <laughs> but so you just never know. Mm, this is true. This is true. So it's not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a defence, but it's done quite well for you, hasn't it, though, writing the autobiographical novels? Would you recommend it if anybody's wondering, if anybody thinks that their material is a bit too hot to handle for your memoir? I would. I mean, it's difficult because I don't want to be flippant about other people's difficult, the difficult things in people's lives. And I remember being asked this question probably by you. And 
uh, Satnam Sangira was on stage and he said, I wouldn't recommend it. It's really hard. Mm. Whereas I'd say, yeah, do it. God, you get it all out, you <laughs> out your dad, you reveal your mother was promiscuous and an alcoholic and we all have a good laugh. But it's not, so it, yes, it's been great for me, but I'm not going to suggest everyone should do it. Not necessarily for everyone. Um, Joe, I would imagine probably being asked whether there's any autobiographical stuff in your novels is an annoying question for you, isn't it? Which I'm not asking you even, but I just it's sort of like segueing on from the previous thing. I wonder if you want to talk a bit about I, I don't know, just like how how you find your subjects or where the inspiration comes from. Do you, I mean do you and if you're setting if you're looking for something new, like is it inactive? I want to find a subject for my next novel or do you always have lots of kind of ideas circling in the air um I think and you could never ask an annoying question Patty just as an aside really um I think my characters just arrive in my head I think I spend a lot of time on my own so I end up talking to imaginary people um and they arrived quite fully formed and I think what have they got to tell me what what story is Linda going to tell me um, but as far as autobiographical, I obviously wrote Breaking and Mending, um, which was autobiographical about my time as a junior doctor. And I was asked to write that. I was invited to write that by Welcome after I'd done an event with them. And when they said, oh, do you fancy writing a memoir about how stressful being a junior doctor is? And I thought, oh, yes, I definitely <laughs> I've got lots to say about that. And it was the hardest thing I have ever done. Oh. It, it was it was so hard because I had to revisit things that I had put away in my head and not really dealt yes. with. And I can remember the first time I did a reading from Breaking and Mending. And obviously I did readings all the time with Goats and Sheep and Elsie, but this was Breaking and Mending. And I had to stand on a stage in front of 200 strangers and talk about my life. And it was really, really awful. I mean, it was therapeutic in the end, but oh my goodness. And to not be able to hide behind characters because all of my books have got bits of me in. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm completely Linda if anybody's read it and is worried. <laughs> I'm not completely Linda. But there are bits of me, there are bits of Linda in me, definitely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Breaking and Mending was the whole of the ball game. And I can remember sitting at the kitchen table writing it. And I write two very long chapters about some really awful things that happened. And I wrote them and I knew they would never end up in the book. And when I'd finished writing them, I got up from the kitchen table, walked across the kitchen and threw them into the Argo because I knew they wouldn't end up in the book. But I had to get them out. I had to kind of exorcise me, myself. Um, but I found it really tough. It was it was brilliant in the end. It was definitely well worth doing. But but it was very, very hard, a lot harder than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. The most moving bit of the, your novel, Joe, for me oh. was Linda's wisdom on life was her, you know, just commentating on it, just looking around and saying, um, you know, the thing that I've mentioned earlier about the couple arguing. There's mm -hmm. my favorite, Linda, I, I, first of all, I think it's a hilarious book. Thank you. Did you, Thank is it, you. I mean, I shouldn't say is it meant to be, but is it billed as a hilarious book? I found Well, it's, it's, I think it's billed as a dark comedy. Um, yeah. But I think you have to have joy and laughter even oh, yeah. in, as we were saying earlier, even in bad situations, yeah, you yeah. have to have humour. Yeah. Um, and I, I like Lynn, like you say, she, she's a good commentator. And you're going to get humour when she She's when very she funny. She's very dry. She says this, I wrote it down. She says that she's talking about being at the pub. And so, again, we get that whole thing about what it's really like being a married couple, going out on a Friday evening to the pub. It ain't that great. Mm. And she says... She said that the last orders are called. She said, Terry always gets himself two pints at last orders and I have to sit there and watch him drink them. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's I've... marriage. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean literally, but, you know, that... It's an element got... of marriage. Yeah. yeah, they've got it sewn up. They know they can't get another pint, so they're going to get two. Mm. And that means you're not going home yet. Yeah. You just yes. got to wait while they swig them down. Yeah, and I'm not married, but I can heavily relate to Linda's, <laughs> Linda's experience. And I think because I, I grew up watching Talking Heads and Alan Bennett, and I think it's that kind of narrator and that voice that yeah. I really love. Yeah. Because I can remember watching those when I was very young and thinking, yeah. 
oh my god I know who these people are they've only said yeah. two sentences and I know who they are yes. and I think it affected me so much yes that it made me listen to voice a lot more so yeah. Yeah. I could see Julie Walters as Linda she'd be fab wouldn't she yeah, she, would. she would be good yeah she'd be good we need yeah. more older female characters Oh, yes, absolutely. I was wondering also if we could talk about dogs, because is it fair to say there's quite a lot of dogs going on in both of your novels, your oeuvre, lots quite dogs. dogs, quite a lot lots of dogs. Of dogs, yeah, lots yes. of dogs. There will always be dogs Yeah, in our novels, we were saying yeah. earlier, always be yeah. dogs. always dogs. I mean, so much so that I hadn't put much of a dog. I didn't want my narrator to have a dog because I didn't want her life to be that nice. I wanted it to be, I didn't want her to have anything really perfect. So she's mm -hmm. only really allowed to, um, she fosters a dog with this. It's, um, I think it, I call it the Blueberry Trust. It's from, it's the Cinnamon Trust. Cinnamon Trust, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've, ad I've um, adopted and fostered on Cinnamon. But so she has this dog and and it, it causes a row because she's agreed to look after a dog while somebody goes on a bereavement cruise and her husband's cross not because he doesn't like the dog just because susan had agreed to do it without checking with him mm. so the dog becomes part of her general uh yeah 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 well my book is dedicated to my last dog oh i so saw there that is, uh, there is definitely yeah. a dog in my book because um, he, he died during lockdown, during the first lockdown. Um, and he was there for every page that I wrote. So I thought this is logical to then yeah. dedicate the book to him. Yeah. So, so there he sits. Yeah. Yeah. Always be dogs. Always. Mm. Dogs do make the world like, go round. Do you like reading about dogs in other people's novels? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I always judge people by if they like dogs or not. Or if I like animals or not, I think it's a good barometer of somebody's character. Um, but you, so but sometimes they get it wrong, don't they? They'll they do a, get it wrong. They'll have, yeah. a dog, they'll have a dog lover who clearly doesn't actually love dogs because they just leave the dog at home all day on its own. And you think, mm. hmm, I don't know whether I like you that much now because poor old Cookie's been on her own all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we judge, we judge. Does it put you yeah. off then if somebody's not treating their dog very well? There's a recent novel by a beloved author that has a dog that's not very well looked after and it did I love the author and I love the book because it's funny but I did slightly think yikes you should have had it sensitivity read dog dog sensitivity <laughs> yeah we could have read. done that couldn't we yeah we, we could have done put it ourselves forward for sensitivity reading yeah. for animals yeah yeah <laughs> totally totally if ever our writing uh dries up we can mm. offer that up to publishers i think we'd be excellent because yeah. people would say to me why don't you become a vet instead of a doctor yeah. because you love animals so much it's because i'd be taking animals. people's dogs off them all the time because i didn't yeah. think they deserved them yeah yeah so i'd be confiscating people's animals <laughs> <laughs> you know when sometimes people write a story from the perspective of the dog would mm. either consider doing that um no I don't think I, I think it's weird when people speak in cat and dog voices on the internet I mean good for them and everything if they like doing that that's lovely but I also oh, you mean you mean where the, the where the they, they where put the, voice. the dog yeah so you could have you could have Lewis the dog <clears throat> yes have his own, yeah because yeah. people say to me why doesn't Lewis have his own Twitter account and he can talk to us and I thought if I ever do that please kill me <laughs> because I just, I just, I just couldn't. If people want to do that, that's lovely, and I am not, I'm not throwing shade at anyone in particular. But it always freaks me out very slightly when people start speaking in cat voices. <laughs> I just, I just think it's a little bit, a little bit strange. Mm. So I can't imagine writing a whole book from Lewis's perspective. I think that would be a little bit, a bit limited and a bit weird. I think. Mm. I don't know. I think there's been a couple of good ones. I, there was one. Do you remember? I, I Cheetah was the chimp. Oh, no. No, I, I Cheetah. Oh. Do you remember it, Cathy? Yeah, from the, it was written from the perspective of... Cheetah the chimpanzee. Yeah. Barzan. Oh. I went to the book launch for that at London yeah. Zoo. Yeah. Oh, wow. That must it have been amazing. Uh, it was amazing, yeah. But it was um, a comedy. It wasn't, yeah. you know, that's the, I think that's what made it work, that it was, it was absurd. Um, yeah. And he was mischievous and made all sorts of comments. 
But, you know, the great and the good have done it. I mean, Virginia Woolf's written. Has she well, written The Dog's true. Voice? Or has she? did she write in The Dog's yeah, Voice? Flush, didn't she? Which was about yeah. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's story. Yeah, but was it in Flash? It was Flash. Was it? I don't know. I don't think I've ever read it. There's, when she and Vita Sackville West had their love affair, their correspondence with each other is full of, like, chat about their dogs. Yeah. And Virginia says something like, I'm going to get this a bit wrong, but it's something like, um, I, so her dog was called Grizzle, and something like, I came back feeling ashamed, not that Leonard would notice I'd been seduced, but that Grizzle has, that kind of thing. Oh, yes. Uh, all this kind <laughs> of, like, <laughs> Mm. Flirty dog chat, which is quite mm. funny. I wonder, I wonder about it. Not that I ever do want to do it, but I spend an awful lot of time in my house about my daily work, wondering what the cats are thinking of me, mm, yeah. <laughs> or of all of us. Wondering if the and I definitely think our uh, older cat, I think, really likes it when I go away. Um, and I'm sure when I come back, I, she sort of looks at uh, looks up, sees me come in the door. And she's oh she's back again. Like <laughs> I, I, when when I'm away, she gets to sleep on my side of the bed. Ah, uh, she likes it that way. So I definitely feel like when I when I come back, I feel she's a bit like oh that one. Um, yeah. So, but yes. again, I have no idea whether what's going on in her cat mind and whether that is in any way because it could be objectively true. I think her life probably is a little bit less nice when I'm here taking up space in the bed and. Um, you know, that so she doesn't get to sleep on my side of the bed anymore. But I don't know whether she, you know, what it says about me that I think you know, even the cat doesn't want me to come <laughs> <down>. <laughs> Oh, I do like, I do like stuff about dogs and cats. I love the Mary Oliver poems about dogs. Mm. I think she's amazing, which is amazing anyway. But mm. is it called Dog Songs, I think, or something like that. That's mm. beautiful. I love stuff like that. Really, really nice. There's a recent dog that I love in a book, which is um, in Bonnie Garmus's Lessons in Chemistry. She has this adorable dog who's called 630. Oh. And, and he, it's from his point of view, for a, for a couple of key moments in the, in the novel. Mm. And it's rather good. I liked it. Um, I've got that in my chibi, re, chibi red pile. So it's yeah, oh, it's really great. Somewhere. It's yeah. really great. And I did, when I was a kid, I, my sister ha was a horse lover and had a, as a, at a young age, got, got a lovely horse. And my mum decided that I had to have one to make it even, to be fair. And I kept saying, I don't want a horse. I'm six years old. I just don't want one. But she made me have one. And I had him for, I got him when I was seven and I had him till I was 14. And I adored him. Oh. For the first couple of years, I really was terrified of him, and I kept weeing myself and making oh. his saddle go mouldy. But I oh. adored him um, once I got used to him. But he was really naughty and charismatic and just mischievous. And I did say in my first autobiographical novel that I had my character, who is me, say, I am going to write a book all about this pony. And people constantly say, when are you going to write the book about Maxwell? And I think, well, there wouldn't be enough to say. It would be a tiny, it would be a Mary Oliver poem. But we'd all read it, Nina. Yeah. So. <clears throat> definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I find horses quite terrifying anyway. I find they're oh, beautiful. I adore them. I, I love I love them, but I do. I remember when I first went riding, you don't realise how big a horse is until you're standing next to it. I thought, oh, my mm. God. But mm. I do love them. I do. And I love the therapy I've seen um, footage of, of horses as, as therapy, like equine therapy. Yes, it's yes. quite incredible yeah, how the horse can read you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're amazing. Can I ask you both about your um, process in the sense of, obviously, we've talked about not planning, but can I ask you about, like, do you write a particular time of day? Do you have like, all that sort of thing? What you've got going on with that? I'll let Nina go first because... I'm not normal, and I'm sure Nina is. So I'll let Nina answer your question first. I don't know if I'm normal. <laughs> I I know when the best time is, and I know what I should do. And when I do it, I get great results. And that is, if I started writing early, very early in the morning, before I do anything else, before I put the radio on, or look at my phone, or anything like that, or speak to anybody, 
I did it yesterday morning, actually, and I thought, oh, God, I've got to start doing this again because I was just going great guns. Mm. But I, for some reason, I don't do it. I know I should, but I get to sort of 11 o'clock and I think, OK, now I've done Pilates, I've listened to the news, I've done all the other things I need to do. Now I'll get some writing done. But my brain's already gone a bit funny by then. Mm. Mm. So I know what I should do, but I don't do it. What about you, Joe? I I do what you just described. I get up, I go to bed quite early, depending on what's happening. I get up about two, half two. I walk Lewis, clear my head, and then I write. And I write when there's no one else around. I write when there are no emails, when Twitter's at a standstill, when Instagram's at a standstill. There's no disruption. My head isn't cluttered with anything. I've not spoken to anyone or done anything. And I just sit and write. Mm. Um, and I've always done that since since I wrote Goats and Sheep. I, when I was at medical school, I used to get up that early because it was the only time I could have for myself. So I've always written very, very early in the morning. Mm. And then by kind of two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm done. And mm. that, that's my evening kind of time. Um, but I'm much more productive first thing in the morning before anybody or anything has entered my brain because I need complete silence and, and peace peace mm. of mind to write so, so how early how early did you say that was I get up about two half two that is very yeah. see I think of that as the middle of the night I know most people when I go online if I do go online people haven't gone to bed yet yeah. um but to me that because yeah. I did an interview recently and the guy I was talking to said have you ever tried being normal and getting up and going to bed and I was normal doesn't work for me I've tried it it doesn't work I can't write mm. when the day's going on around me I have to have that mm. silence mm. and I love the peace and quiet of that time and then you have the dawn breaking and you it's can beautiful. go out. I write into the dawn yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's nice it's lovely and I think you know what I, I it just doesn't work for me any other way I, I need that peace and quiet so it's, it's a bit of a bugger trying to go to bed early because especially this time of year when it's like bright sunshine and 20 degrees um but it, it does work for me and I think that's the thing with if there are any aspiring writers or writers listening in I used to like read what other people did and think I've got to do that mm. I've got to do that they get up at this time and do this and they write yeah. notes and there are no rules yeah. you, you do what I know Kit Duval writes very late yeah. Lionel Shriver is like working on the opposite body clock to me because we shared a publicist yeah. at one point. Yeah. Um, and it's what works for you and what you feel good doing. Um, and that's the most important thing, not what everyone else does, in my opinion. Mm. I always want, I'm always tempted to try out pe other people's things. So, you know, I know for me, it's first thing, no distractions. Again, mm. not really much more than a couple of hours. If I do a couple of hours, that's a good day. Uh, mm. But when I, I love, I love asking other people what they do. And then I really would like to, I'd like to spend a whole book, like do a chapter by chapter, like chapter one, the Joanna Cannon method, and chapter <laughs> two, the Jamal method, and see if I could do it without going. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, that there's a piece really in that. Fun. That would be yeah. fun. Because people. Not just time, you could do it like, um because Patrick Gale writes his novels in longhand. So whenever I'm with him, I always think like, oh, I could write my novel in longhand. And then mm. I'll talk to someone who's basically like done it on the, you know, the notes app on their iPhone and think like, oh, I could try it like that. So maybe I could do the same for every chapter. I could have someone else's bit of process and just give it a whirl and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. I can remember reading about somebody that wrote and it ended up being a best selling novel and they wrote it on the tube on their phone. Mm. as they were commuting and it just blows my mind because I can't have any I don't know about you Nina but I can't have anything around me noise nothing I need silence and I would love to be able to go to coffee shops and write like all these fashionable people do but I just can't because I'd be too busy eavesdropping mm. and I need yeah. silence do you write in silence or do you no I like something going on but mm. it can't be my own family okay no I can't so ideally for me it would be a really nice but not too noisy, but sort of a cafe outside with no wind and stuff going on, but quite quietly. Mm -hmm. So one of my books, I wrote um, a lot of it in this hotel garden in Mallorca Ooh, on a family holiday. And I just, I went, I found this really nice little shady place. And I thought, oh God, I'm just going to get this table every day and just write my book. And I did. Mm. And I thought that's what I want, but I can't afford to go and do that. 
So I go, I go in cafes here in Truro where I live or London uh, where I am a lot. Um, I'm quite good on a train. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I'm not good in my own house. Yeah, that's problematic. It's strange, isn't it? It's strange. Yeah. I know when we, when Kathy and I did our event with Elizabeth Day, and she normally writes in a coffee shop, and she said, didn't she, Kathy, that when lockdown was on, she downloaded some app that gave you coffee shop noise. Wow. So that she could write to a coffee shop noise yeah. because she was so used to it. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. weird how you get... Yeah. And I think it's a kind of mental relaxation thing when you're on holiday and sitting in that lovely shady, yeah. shady seat, you, 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 your mind relaxed and allowed it. Do you know what I didn't have in that setting? I didn't have to do any washing mm. or shopping mm. or cooking, not even for me, for nobody. I, I, I had no responsibility. So I think that's the thing mm. that, that it's horrible when you've got to run your life as well. Yeah. As a book. I think that's yeah. tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is because everything encroaches on. Yeah. And I found in lockdown, I couldn't write at all for a long time. I couldn't even read. Mm. I was too busy being frightened to death mm. and anxious and scrolling the Guardian live blog every day mm. about what was going on. Yeah. And I just, I couldn't even read a book. I couldn't watch a film, couldn't do anything. My concentration was just screwed, awful. Mm. So oh. it, it really affects you. Your, your kind of landscape really affects you. Yeah. Mm. I do think getting away from the domestic front is the ideal thing, but when I can't, the thing that cheers me up is that um, it cheered me up when I read that Agatha Christie used to think out her plots whilst doing the washing up. I just... so when I, yeah, so when I you know have to do domestic stuff, which of course I hate, I just keep trying to remind myself of that and see if I could you know rather than just boil with resentment, see if I could if I can put any of that mental mental space to good good use well I, I used to have really oh, bad panic, really bad panic attacks when I was a teenager really really awful panic attacks and washing up was the thing that calmed me down wow. I found it I think the warm water and the kind yes. of repetitive and you didn't have to think mm. and and that mm. used to really so I can I can relate to Agatha on that mm. level yeah I think it works a different part of your brain and allows allows your mind to relax a little bit yeah weird times um, tell me, both of you, do you like the process of your book jackets being decided upon? Um, do you have input into it? Is that an enjoyable thing? Does it matter to you how they... I've got the finished copy of yours here, Nina. And Joe, I've got your proof. I don't know if you've got one to hand. So this is... Mm. Um, I just have to disappear off the screen for a minute. But give me a second and I will get a finished I copy the, uh, I love this bit from the back the daffodils oh, yeah yeah shall I start talking about that while yeah. Jo's looking for her book I got my um, book yes I I love the covers coming in because they come in so <laughs> early that you start it gives you a real sense of it's happening and it gives me a spur so I quite like it with that particular cover Kathy um i showed it to my daughter and she said the woman's nose is too small why do why do women always have to have tiny little button noses and you know why does she look so pretty when so we uglied her up <laughs> it bluntly not that it's meant to look like me i know that sounds an odd thing to say it's not meant to look you know like a jewish woman it's meant to just look like somebody who isn't you know, a woman on the front cover of a book. Yeah. So that was interesting. That's the first time I've gone back with a a negative comment. And they did they did give her a bigger nose and they did sort of scruff her hair up a bit. Mm -hmm. Um but I like it. I like I like all the cover business. What about you, Joe? Um well I've got a finished copy here. Um, yeah. and it's Claire Ward and her team at Harper Collins who do the most amazing covers mm. and I knew I loved it the minute I saw it mm. um, because I love the magpie because we were originally when we were looking at titles we were looking at various garden birds mm. but then there was a, a huge outpouring of garden bird title books and I thought no 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 we can't have garden birds there's a lot of garden birds um, so some of Harper Collins came up with the title um, but the, the magpie survived the garden bird coal and the upside down daffodils and I, I'm the same as you it feels real when you start yeah. getting, you start yeah. getting a, um, a cover 
and titles I like I like to have a title oh, yeah. you have the best titles Nina your books are mint titles yeah oh I love mint this title. title oh thank you thank you I love because and the thing is it's absolutely true <coughs> it's such a tight it's it really is well it's tidy in Welsh has a slightly different connotation yes um, when something's tidy um so yeah it all all worked together but it we works well yeah we struggled with titles with this one. Goats and Sheep, I already had it ready. Three things about Elsie, my editor, um, came up with. And this one's not Harper Collins. Had so the genius when, idea. When you're writing, do you not know the title? <coughs> I didn't with this one, no. Mm. I didn't with this one, which I don't like. I like to have a title. Mm. Because I, I um, to quote Julie Cohen, another author who um, does a lot of creative writing teaching, mm. she said you should be able to sum your book up and what it's about in one word. And you need to put that word in a post-it note. You need to put it above your laptop, wherever you write, and keep focusing on that word. And it's such a good thing to do. It really focuses your attention. Gosh. And um, I find that with titles as well. I find that it helps me focus on what I'm trying to say, yeah. if I think about the title. Did you have yours at the beginning, or did it? No, yeah. I didn't. I was gonna, I, I was gonna call it, Oh God, I can't remember. I was going to call it, is it something to do with driving? Mm. And um, and then I decided I'd have it the motto of the university. And then I looked for a motto. And in fact, my son's girlfriend came up with it. It is a oh. real motto that really- Is it really? Oh there's wow. A tiny, there's a tiny little college in Durham um, that is called that, that's the, that, sorry, that's the motto of the college. It's a, it's a tiny part of Durham University. It's an old education college. Oh, I think you need to get your marketing people to bring out some merch. Because yeah. I would totally buy some merch with that. And I think it's a brilliant title. Yeah. It's fabulous. Well, thank you. But it's funny. Um, I didn't like one of my titles. I thought it was really clever, but I didn't think it would work. And when I told my editor, I said, oh, so-and-so said it should be called Paradise Lost Lodge. And she went, oh, that's brilliant. Yes, we'll do that. And I thought, oh, I'll go with it. But actually now I think probably not. Mm. What about you, Cathy? You've got a great title for your, yeah, yeah. your um, current novel. Yeah, but I'm just interested in what was it before Paradise Lodge? No, I hadn't got a title. It was called Lizzie 16. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Right. I haven't got a title. I it, it was my, my friend said that, that there was a television programme set in an old people's home that wasn't called this, but the old people's home, not the TV program, mm. was called Paradise Lodge. Yeah, and he that said, rings a bell actually. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. something like it was about old people. It was Stephanie Beecham and yeah, it was called Waiting for God. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And they were in Paradise Lodge. They were, and it just were. seemed quite funny. It seemed quite literary and funny, but then I thought the word paradise isn't good. And lodge isn't a good word, and but so I didn't like it. But then Mary, my editor, went, "Oh my God, that's perfect!" So I went, "Oh yeah, hooray!" <laughs> but really, I shouldn't have called it that. I should have—that's me being a people pleaser. You see, I should have said, "No, paradise is a really bad word, and lodge is boring." How are you addressing this people pleasing thing? Because I need tips. Because I'm I'm like a Labrador puppy with people. Oh. How, how are you? You said you're addressing it. You're not doing that anymore. I'm just being trying to be more honest. <clears throat> Yeah. So, so the main thing is to say, oh, no, thank you. No, I don't want to do that. Mm. Um, and just being less eager to make everybody love me. Because mm. I think as authors, you feel, no matter where you are in your career, you feel as though you've got to go the extra mile with people and you, you've yeah. got to say yes to everything because you're so lucky yes. that you're, yes. you're, you're who you are and you've got a best-selling book and you, you need to just accept that you need to do stuff. And it's hard to say no. It is. And of course, I've become an author quite late in life and I was already become... I became a people pleaser when I had kids because I remember my mum being terribly disapproved of and hated and that nobody liked her and they were just, you know, they were fed up with her. And, and I thought, I am not being that woman. So I became this perfect parent, endlessly mm. making fucking cakes and, you know, just doing all the stuff. And it, I, it, I just overdid it, mm. you know, going for mother of the year the whole time. And then mm. I became an author and I, yeah, this feeling 
that I should be grateful mm. all the time. So it's a perfect storm. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit trying to be amusing about it, but actually I am trying to be better. And I am saying, look, I'm really glad you've invited me, but I just don't want to go to yeah. that place on that day. And I'll do, you know, do ask me again, but no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough call though. Yeah, I it's can't really think why. Call. I would have thought you were much stronger than that. Oh no, I'm hopeless. Really? I'm hopeless, yeah. And I think it's a, I was analysing this the other day and I think it comes from, a feeling, a, a lack of self-worth mm. that you need external approval yeah. to feel good about yourself. And in order to get, so this is me personally, not everyone. Mm. And in order to get that external approval, you have to please people. Mm. And then you get, you get this approval. The, the sense of self-worth doesn't come from inside. It's an external thing, which is a very dangerous path to go mm. down. Um, but I think that's where mine comes from, is wanting to please people so therefore I get approved and I feel validated. Mm. Um, and also as women, I don't know if male authors feel obliged to say yes to everything, um, but as women, you know, very often when people will say, oh, you've done so well, you've, you've written these books, and you, I'll say, yes, I've been very lucky. And I say, <laughs> but actually, no, I might, there might have been fortune in there, but I've worked bloody hard for this. Mm. but you never acknowledge that you say oh yes I've been very lucky and that's your standard answer when people mm -hmm. praise you for something and this this is all the narrative <laughs> the narrative is screwed mm. you know it's a wonder it's no wonder we walk around trying to please everybody because our internal narrator is constantly nagging at us yeah that we've just been very lucky we should be very grateful for what we've got yeah which we are but you know still I don't know that's my that's my psychiatry hat on well you have both very much pleased me tonight. Not that that was your job and not that you had to. It's just happened as a very delicious byproduct of having you both here to talk with such generosity and openness about your books and your writing and your lives. So um, thank you very much indeed, Joanna Cannon and Nina Stibby for a really stimulating Oh, Thank you, Cathy, for being such a brilliant interviewer as always. Yeah, as, as always. always. Thank you, Cathy. Okay.